Hi, everyone. Corey Fleck here. I'm your host of this KE Report webinar. This webinar is also produced in conjunction with Focus Communications. In this webinar, I'm excited to have on Alloro Resources, traded on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol ELO, also on the OTCQX under the symbol ELRRF. Now, I have a group or a team of the Alora representatives on with me. We have Tom Larson, President and CEO, also Bill Pearson, Executive Vice President of Exploration, as well as Quentin Henney, Technical Advisor. Now, I'm going to let the team run through a presentation to bring everybody up to speed on some of the fundamentals of Alora Resources and a big focus on the company's flagship Isca Isca project in Bolivia. Now, I know a lot of my listeners are up to date on this story because, look, Aloro has been putting out a lot of very impressive drill results over the past probably year plus now. And it's garnered a lot of attention from our listeners thanks to the silver and tin aspect of this project. Now, you all have the ability to ask questions throughout this webinar. I ask that you please use this webinar uh, feature or the webinar program in either the chat or the Q&A section. I will be interjecting those questions throughout this webinar, trying to tie them into whatever slide they relate most to. At the tail end of this webinar, we will also be having a bit more of a Q&A question period. And if we don't get to any of your questions throughout this webinar, you can always email me personally Fleck, that is F-L-E-C-K, at kereport.com. Guys, I first and foremost want to thank you for taking time to share the Aloro story. And Tom, President and CEO of Aloro, please kick us off with a little background on the company. I will fire up the slides now for you guys to speak to. Excellent. Thanks for having us, Corey. It's a pleasure to be here to address your audience. Uh, I have with me Dr. Bill Pearson, Executive VP exploration for Allura Resources, and also Dr. Quinton Hennig, our senior technical advisor. The two of them will uh, go through the, the updated technical aspects of, of the company, just the progression that ISCA ISCA uh, is, is, is involved in at this point in time. Uh, I'll just go through, just uh, basically refresh everyone as to current corporate structure. Nothing's really changed over the last few months, uh, but we'll just go quickly here. In the background, you see the great volcanic edifice of, Is of Isca Isca, uh, the silver tin polymetallic project. Uh, we're sitting with your typical mandatory standard disclaimer. On to uh, basically who we are again. Uh, publicly traded, public, publicly traded exploration mine development company, and again focused on the ISCA ISCA silver tin multi-metal polymetallic property in the Potosi Department of Southern Bolivia. Uh, symbol ELO, TSXD, uh, Frankfurt listing and OTCQX under symbol ELRRF. Again, we have an option to acquire a 99% or take control of a 99% interest in this nine square kilometer highly prospective project, uh, which hosts this uh, major silver tin polymetallic. We are located 4,000 meters above sea level along a very flat lying antiplano uh, uh, to topography, very conducive for, uh, for the work that we're doing. Uh, we raised over 30 million Canadian in Q1, 2021. This was a bought deal. Uh, finance led through Haywood Securities, uh, Cantor Fitzgerald and Cormark were also very much involved in that financing. Uh, $6 million financing at $1.75 with Apple Warrant and a secondary $25 million financing at $3.75 a month or so later after some pretty impressive draw results that uh, moved our, our valuation up. Uh, aggressive drilling campaign to date. Uh, I think we're close to 53, 54,000 meters um, over uh, 81, 82 holes to date drilled uh, since the inaugural startup uh, property having never been drilled. They start up from the Hiracasa underground at it in September of 2020. 
So here's our share cap, 63.68 million outstanding, fully diluted, 77.11. Uh, we're trading around 525, 530. Um, so share cap overall from the outstanding of around 330, 340 million Canadian. And again, management directors, advisors, significant shareholders have close to 28 million of that 63.68. Uh, again, we have like, you know, this is exploration, exploration and, and future development. Uh, so the team, a very strong technical team that's led by Dr. Bill Pearson. Bill and I go back a long way. Um, and uh, he was very uh, highly recognized in geological circles, especially with the Jacobina extent, extension uh, uh, discoveries that were subsequently picked up, uh, bought by Yamana, which is one of their flagship, main flagship properties today. Uh, it was a former Desert Sun property. Uh, Dr. Quentin Hennig, who I think that your audience knows very well. Uh, I got to know Dr. Quentin Hennig, Hennig through a, uh, we had a, a friend of ours over in, in, in uh, Lausanne actually, introduce uh, Quentin to Aloro. Uh, as to the Bolivian, especially our Bolivian property project. And Quinton was very instrumental in uh, basically bringing Crestcat Capital uh, coming in as our first uh, institutional investor at a low price, but that was high risk back then. And uh, they've been with us ever since. And Quinton works very closely uh, when, when asked with uh, Dr. Pearson and with uh, Dr. Osvaldo Arce. Dr. Osvaldo Arce was the fellow that actually brought the opportunity uh, to Aloro, to myself and Bill, uh, back in 2019. And Dr. Osvaldo Arce, uh, born, raised in Bolivia, his father was Raul um, Arce, who was national manager at Comable, the state-run mining arm of the Bolivian government. Uh, Bolivia is a small place. Uh, people know people there, obviously. and um, he was president of the Geological Society uh, of Bolivia from 2010 to 2018. He's the one that spent time on the property at Isca Isca, and uh, he's the one that suggested that it, you know, it checked the boxes for us to get involved. So those three are the guys, the driving force behind this uh, pretty, uh, uh, I would say, uh, very fast uh, moving. Uh, drilling project and what we're coming up with. Uh, next, we have Bolivia itself. I mean, look at, I've had, there's more and more people getting involved in the, the department of uh, Potosi, especially. A lot of new players uh, coming in. Um, the the new government, well, it's the same, the MAS party, but Luis Arce, uh, you know, finance, finance background from the University of Warwick in London, England at least in England, sorry, uh, but very, very uh, progressive uh, in attitude when it comes to trying to uh, attract foreign investment to the country. Uh, like just recently, a 0% VAT on any incoming mining industrial equipment. Um, they are looking, I mean, basically mining, especially in our area, uh, probably is a, one of the largest contributors to the Bolivian economy, uh, you know, 30%. Uh, at least, we find Bolivia uh, a great place to be working. Here's a here's an infrastructure uh, map that we put in recently into our into our deck, and this sort of shows you the accessibility from the standpoint of where Isca Isca is located. It also shows the San Cristobal, a very active mine. Uh, it runs over 50,000 tons a day of material and has both three components, a silver, a zinc, a lead. And these, these concentrates are then taken by rail down to the port in Chile uh, and off to the smelters in Sumitomo in Japan. Uh, you can see that we're, you know, power is close by, we have water uh, source, and we're very close to road and to built-in infrastructure being rail, for instance, two smelters, that are also on rail and road access from where our location is. So we're we're in a, in a good situation from an from an infrastructure standpoint. Uh, again, as I mentioned, 
uh, easy topography. That's 4,000 meters up. That's a in the forefront. That's a, a drill pad, surface drill pad on our Santa Barbara um, basic breccia uh, form, uh, volcanic form uh, structure. So it, it, you see there's no Guimperos, there's no community. It's a fantastic place to be working. Uh, Edwin Miegas, the owner, this is a private run, privately owned project. Edwin's highly uh, regarded in the in the district. Uh, he's the uh, re recently elected as a VP director of the Topiza Mining Chamber uh, of, of the Department of Potosi. Uh, next. I'm not, I, I mean, I think the reason we're here today, we understand the, you know, the importance of some of these future metals. Silver would be deemed as one. Uh, there's a lot of silver players out there, but I think the sheer size of what we're up to, what we're starting to show, which we'll see over the next few months, you're going to see, I'm, I'm expecting, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, a very large silver component to this overall uh, project. Um, so there's strong demand for silver. We haven't seen silver really move that much. It's been sort of in this $25 range, but even the $25 range uh, is with the grades that we're getting is most economic. Next. Now, tin is very interesting. Uh, when we first got involved in this, it was more based on, you know, silver, uh, zinc. Uh, those were the two big components that we thought primarily silver, but we've really come in, you know, we're definitely on the, in, in, within the uh, Bolivian tin belt. And we really are coming in with some very interesting numbers. I mean, we're getting 0.2% uh, percent tin in a lot of cases uh, per ton of ore, 0.2%. Uh, you convert that, that's four pounds of tin per ton. A pound of tin's trading at over $20 US today, close to $20 US. $40,000 a ton. So, you know, four pounds, 20, that's $80 rock, just, just on the tin component alone. And we're getting other higher grade material, uh, material from the, uh, you know, from the drill bit. So I think tin's going to be, it's one of those things, it's a very small market, 300,000 tons produced annually. The Chinese have around 30%, 30, 30,000, 30, at least 10%. 30,000 tons that they contain that they use doesn't hit the market. You have Myanmar. Uh, you've got the San Rafael just to the southeast Peru in the Bolivian tin belt that's active right now. They have a smelter there. That's probably 20 million, 20,000 tons a year. The Bolivian uh, outputs only about 14,000 tons based on two smelters underutilized. Tin prices have gone through the roof over the last uh, few months. I think there's a real niche here. If we can show a major bulk tonnage operation, major tonnage that could last for you know multiple years. This could be very interesting for a, a big balance sheet to come in if they're that interested in the tin market. We just noticed that a, a big player in Cornish Metals, um, Sir Nick Davis from Strata, Glencore fame, uh, just put a, a substantial investment into a tin company that's been resurrected uh, in Cornwall. So people are starting to pay attention to the tin market. The, again, the definitive agreement where we have to make a $10 million US payment before January 6, 2024. And uh, we already, because of the drill results and, and, and how we really appreciate the Viegas, the owners of the property, their work on site, uh, the road access, the rehabbing of the of the uh, adits that we're, we're working from, from the uh, just their accommodation in Tapiza that oversee our Bolivian workforce being 15, 16 or so technical geologists uh, that, are, that work out of Tapiza where our core, everything's located. We decided to make a 3 million US payment to them, uh, you know, a few months ago. So we're down to 7 million US owing uh, to the Viegas family. And we have until again, January 6, 2024, to make that payment. We've issued 500,000 shares. Uh, the deal was signed January 6, 2020. So uh, good relationships, really happy and pleased that uh, we're working with the Viegas family. Obviously, social license is so critical. 
Um, and, you know, I mean, we've written, we've saw, obviously followed the case study of San Cristobal and, 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 and how they performed in getting their major project into production. I mean, they spent over $1.8 billion back to 2005, 2008 to go into a 40,000 ton a day operation. And obviously there was major social license, whether you're dealing with mig migratory habits of llamas, uh, quina, uh, farming, um, you know, just a lot of different things. But most importantly, we're pushing Bolivia. Our, our workforce is 100% Bolivia. Our drillers, Leduc drilling, uh, are Bolivian. And uh, for instance, we just set up 100 sanitation stations in nearby communities. Um, so we're obviously very, very committed to making sure that we all work together closely. Tom, can I jump in there real quick? Because there was a question that asked about what the environment is like for actual miners in there. Some of the taxes involved with any mining operations in your neighbors or with your neighbors. Do you have any more information on this since you are talking Bolivia and your relationship right now? Well, there's two, I mean, there's two operations that we, that we know of the Pan American Silver uh, San Vicente project, which is 40, 50 kilometers away northwest of us, and obviously the, the uh, San Cristobal deposit. Uh, there's no, no no sort of compulsory royalties. It's basically a tax. Uh, you, most of your capex is is written off initially, but you you get into a uh, a federal 30, 35 percent tax, and there can be a regional 15 percent. But that's basically uh, that's it from uh, from that standpoint. So uh, I think you know when we look at uh, and then on you know withholding tax for instance. You take a look at our neighbors like Peru or Ecuador, the withholding tax here uh, for foreigners is around 15 percent. Go to Ecuador and, and Peru, you're, you're, you know, you're into the 25, 35 percent. Uh, so, I, you know, I, 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 it's a good place to work. How are your guys permits, too? Because you are doing a lot of drilling. Sounds like you're going to continue to do a lot of drilling. What's the permitting environment? What permits do you guys currently hold? Well, the Viegas family that own the property. Uh, they have the permits that they've had for, you know, several years now, which are basically exploration and small mining uh, permits. And so we're grandfathered through those two permits. And that's what allows us, that would allow us to go all the way to uh, a feasibility study. Uh, you know, once you get into commercialization, obviously there's other permits, environmental, you know, it's a totally different world. But uh, we're not even close to that stage yet. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and finally, these are just some of the are the players, some of the, the uh, foreign public companies, ex exploration and development companies that are in our vicinity. The Cerro Rico de Potosi, uh, that's situated up in the town now called Potosi because of the Cerro Rico deposit, the largest uh, silver tin deposit ever discovered by man. Back in the 16th century, they've taken out over 2.1, 2.2 billion ounces of silver, more artisanal type activities uh, on that. And uh, Dr. Pearson and, and Quinton will explain uh, how our, our, our project is preserved and was, was overlooked for, for, for centuries. But this is uh, this underwrote the Spanish Amada, the, Pot the Potosi uh, silver coinage was used worldwide for barter, uh, for currency exchange. Uh, for many, many years. So that's what really put Bolivia on the map from the standpoint of uh, silver activity, especially. Uh, then you have New Pacific Metals, the Silver Sands. They've done a great job uh, back basically uh, proving up the Silver Sands. They have a couple of other projects now, but they had a share cap that got up to close to a billion dollars, uh, you know, well-followed public company. And that's what sort of spurred Dr. Pearson and I into looking into Bolivia in 2019 after the success of, of New Pacific Metals and wondering, boy, I thought Bolivia was a pretty closed sort of society, not really knowing what was going on. But then you're suddenly getting all of this, uh, you know, this traction in the, in the equity markets. And that's when we just decided to talk to uh, Dr. Oswaldo Arce and hire him to get us going. Uh, you've got Silver Elephant, Puakaya. And they and Precious Metals are fairly new. They bought the San Bartolome area. They're a public, uh, publicly traded company right now. I think around four or five, four hundred million market cap. Uh, some of the Buckin people that ran the, you know, founded Kinross are 
uh, on the board of that company. Um, uh, also, then obviously you have the Sumitomo uh, Corp. Uh, it's San Cristobal deposit. That's a private entity, but Sumitomo is private. And that's a major world-class byproduct silver, lead zinc uh, my operational mine. And again, Pan American Silver, the San Vicente, uh, primarily silver 40 kilometers away from us. So lots of activity from foreigners in our area, which is uh, telling because it's only really been happening over the last you know, two, three years. And uh, I will now pass it on the important stuff to Dr. Bill Pearson. Okay, thanks, Tom. <clears throat> so Tom just mentioned Sarah Rico. There's the picture on the left of the famous uh, hill there. I actually visited that in October. Uh, there's thousands of miners still in there producing uh, away. Uh, most people think of it as silver. It's got a lot of tin plus lead and zinc. And over on the right-hand side is our Iska Iska Hill, uh, which, as I'll show you, has a lot of similarities in terms of metal contents, timing, and mineralization. But it has some really, really unique uh, differences uh, that set it apart. Uh, this just shows you the property covers about 900 hectares. Uh, it's an average elevation of about 4,000 meters. You can see we got a nice road network here. There's no artisanal miners or communities on here. Nearest center is to Pisa, uh, 48 uh, kilometers to the south. <clears throat> now, this is a nice picture. This was some drone imagery we took last fall. Uh, you can see north here off to the right-hand side. Uh, we've got the Santa Barbara Central Porco targets. And you can see the Wawakaza portal and the Santa Barbara portal. Wawakaza, this was a small underground workings excavated by Edwin Viegas in about 300 meters of drifting. Um, when Oswaldo looked at this originally, what really impressed us was how intense the alteration. And of course, we thought we were onto a potentially large system, but of course, we had no idea at the time how this would unfold as it has. Uh, this provided us a good early drill base, and then more recently we've we've been doing a lot of drilling out of the Santa Barbara at it, and we have a couple of, so we have an underground drill and a couple of surface drills going. We've got a fourth drill coming in very shortly. I would characterize this as doing a program in Arizona or Nevada, except at 4,000 uh, meters. So here's a simplified geological map here. You can see the dash black line. That's the caldera complex. It's a classic collapse resurgent caldera emplaced into Ordovician quartz sandstone. So we have these major breccia pipes. The, the small Wawakaza was our first discovery. And then we got into the big Santa Barbara Central. And as I'll show you, there's a huge potential target below the Porco area. So a lot of our drilling has been focused on what we called our mineral resource target area. It's a big target here, about 1,400 meters by 500 by about 600. And I'll show you in more detail uh, shortly. The whole complex we think is probably something like four kilometers along strike in a, in a more or less northwest, southeast direction, at least a couple of kilometers wide. And there's a kilometer of relief from the valley to the peak. So you're looking at a really remarkably preserved volcanic uh, edifice here. Real quick, Bill, let me just hop in here because that is a large scale, right? And even to bring Quentin in here quickly, Quentin, you were early on in this story with Crestcat. Did you see the possibility of the footprint being this large so early on? Uh, yes. Uh, if you look at the geology of this, the caldera, the size of it, it's in line with San Cristobal. And uh, we know that San Cristobal is a very big system now. You know, this uh, has delivered some surprises because I think there's a lot more going on here, perhaps, than even San Cristobal. Uh, you got a lot more uh, individual breccia pipes, uh, but the scale, absolutely, hands down, had to be world class, and this is it. Perfect, Bill. Yeah, continue on here because a lot of people have some direct questions. This could actually tie yeah. into one, so you continue on. Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> this is one of my favorite long sections. You can see it goes 
right across our target area, right through the middle of Santa Barbara, down through here in Porco. Uh, so this is a, a 3D inversion magnetic model. And what it shows you is basically somewhere down in the depth, there's a huge tin porphyry that drove this whole thing. And you've got basically this magmatic tongue coming up here. And right up at the top, you can see Santa Barbara at the top. You can think of uh, Santa Barbara kind of like the frothy top. And that's where you get dominantly silver, zinc, lead, plus some tin. And as we get deeper in the system, uh, we get central, and then also I'll show you a huge target in Porco. We lose the lead and zinc, and we go into much more of a, uh, a tin plus silver, and we get down around Parco, we're also seeing gold and copper. Now, one of the questions I get asked was, how come this thing was never found? Well, you can see the oxide layer here, the oxide sulfide boundary. Well, the oxide layer, which can be 50 meters, sometimes on the hillside, it's more like 100 meters, it's intensely leached. So, when, if you sample the surface, which many, many people certainly have over the years, you get nothing. Um, and, and in fact, when we hit the first uh, hole in our Santa Barbara breccia pipe, um, when Oswaldo Fomian told me about it, I said, wow, you better get our team out there and figure out what's going on. So they went out early in the morning, figured they'd spend a couple hours and they wandered all around the hills all day, came back just before the sun went down. And all they said was mucha brecha, mucha brecha, mucha brecha. So we realized at that point, wow, this system is huge. So the, we haven't quite hit the tin pour free yet, but we're working on it as I'll show you. But look at the scale of this, 2.4K, 1.8. This is a massive system. Now that big blob down on the right there, there was a question that came in that simply asked, what's the potential here? This uh, listener put a well, potential value of 50 to $75 billion. That seems a bit aggressive early on, but what could you see out of the potential of this sort of a porphyry? How big it could Well, let, let me continue and I'll show you what our thinking is. It's still very early uh, and we're drill testing it now, but I think your reader will get a sense of, of the picture that we see unfolding. So this is a more detailed map of, of the Santa Barbara area here. You can see our outline of our target zone. We've done quite a bit of drilling early was radial. We moved to sectional as we understood the structure together. And I, I wanna particularly point to, if I can draw here, this hole around here. You can see the red dot there. That's the Santa Barbara drill bay. And you'll see this is DSBU-03. I'm gonna come back to that hole. Um, what's been developing, particularly since uh, we got a lot of results back out in the last couple of months is this whole Southern area is really, really turning into a very, very high grade area. We keep expanding it as we drill it. We also got some very interesting results on the on the Northwest extension as well. So there is basically mineralization along all these holes over 1400 plus meters of strike length. And in fact, in all our drilling, we're up to low 80s and holes now. All Everything we've drilled is at multiple reportable intersections and uh, uh, which to me is quite remarkable. We have in no way defined the limits of this thing and we keep pushing it out. But the more recent developments, particularly DSB U03 is incredibly exciting. So this is a summary of top 12 intersections. Uh, the scale and size of this is phenomenal. You know, 373 in, in DSB U03, 300, I mean, that's three football fields um, and lots of hundreds and two hundreds. Uh, and you can see the grades here, very, very nice, consistent grade. And as a geologist, that's one thing that really, really impresses me when I look at the uh, grades, sample grades. This isn't something where you got a spike and nothing and a spike and some. 
these holes are continuously mineralized in these intersections. Uh, there's virtually hardly any holes below. We use a 30, 30 gram silver equivalent cutoff in our assay samples. So for example, in DSBU3, there's about 244 samples. Of those, only 17 are below that 30 mark, and those 17 aren't zero. They're like 25, 20, quite remarkable. And you can see the range of grades here. These are our big four elements, uh, silver, tin, zinc, and lead. Now, to show you this better, uh, the next slide gives you a nice visual of the distribution of the major components. And you can see DSBU3 is, is a deeper hole, a lot of tin. And, and basically those four top metals there are ultimately gonna be probably 90% of the overall uh, value. You can see we have other holes like DSB07 uh, has a lot more tin and zinc, far less uh, tin and, and has some, some lead. So that gives you an idea. This, this deposit is definitely zoned, uh, but as I'll show you, the pattern evolving is really as shown on that uh, uh, magnetic model section. Higher up, you're getting silver, lead, and zinc, plus some tin. Deeper down, you're getting a much more tin dominant picture with some silver. We also have some gold, and the other is mainly copper, uh, indium, cadmium, and, and some bismuth. But these four are the ones that are going to be the big, big winners. So guys, real quick, we've had a couple general questions. Since we are talking about grade now, tin is a major component to this uh, drilling so far. Is there any general rule of thumb that people can use to compare, let's say, 0.1% tin grade to gold or silver equivalent? Is there any easy math that people can do in their head? Uh, well, it's probably best done on a spreadsheet uh, because what, what you need to do is just you take the pr price of, the, uh, of, of silver and you take the uh, price of uh, tin, for example, and uh, you just work out what the equivalent would be. So that that's all we've done in these these calculations. You have to just make sure that when you're converting to from tin, which is percent, to grams, which is silver, is you convert the the tin to uh, in the tin to grams when you multiply it. Okay. Uh, how about then if we can talk about what the average grade of a tin deposit is? Can we go that far? Well, it depends. If you're looking at more of the uh, the more bulk type tin deposits, for example, in in uh, Bolivia, from what uh, and there's not a lot of published information, of course, on them. But Osvaldo has visited a lot of these. You know, typically the the more bulk tonnage tin deposits in Bolivia are around point. 0.15 to 0.2 percent, something in that range. Um, you'll hear about uh, tin vein deposits. Um, for example, uh, alpha min down in DRC mines an average grade of about four percent, but that's veins only. In Iska Iska, we're looking at a huge bulk possibility, but we also have veins that run three to four percent. Uh, uh, tin, but certainly from a bulk tonnage perspective, if you're sitting around 0 0.15, 0 0.2 um, percent tin, that's a very good grade. Okay, thanks, Bill. Uh, Quentin, how do you view for, tin? Can we get you well, in here for, quickly yeah. for some comments? Certainly. Look, I, I was doing some math on my calculator. Just <laughs> try to pull out a number uh, to sound intelligent. Um, look, right now at uh, about you know $21 a pound for tin. Um, using that price and then uh current gold price which is about 1930 it's just under uh three quarters of a gram gold equates to 0.1 percent tin okay so if you have 0.2 percent that would be two times that so about a gram and a half you know and that's just the tin in this thing uh you know to answer your question the way i see this is 
you know, the, the lead zinc values are actually in, in silver values are much in line with some other big deposits across Bolivia, you know, notably San Cristobal. But this thing has the tin kicker, and that makes it just absolutely exceptional. Uh, this is kind of like having a, like Bill said, a bulk tonnage tin deposit within or, you know, <laughs> basically the same thing. I mean, they're the same deposit uh, within a San Cristobal type lead zinc silver deposit. I mean, how, how good does that get? It's incredible. Now, does metallurgy play a role in this? Is there any metallurgical issues that you need to be aware of when you do have these this many metals there, Quentin? Maybe. Uh, look, I, I'll let uh, Bill. Look, here's here's my simple answer, and then Bill can fill in detail because he's actually doing the the work on the metallurgy with the uh, metallurgical uh, scientists and stuff. Uh, here's here's the way I see this. Okay, the the mineralogy is quite simple. Uh, so basically, the ore minerals that are present here are all very the typical minerals that we would see for for lead, glina, zinc, sphalerite. Uh, you know, you got tin as cassiterite. That's very important. If it's in cassiterite, you're pretty much uh, you, you got an easier path because cassiterite is a tin oxide. It's a very dense mineral. You can separate it oftentimes with gravity separation, and you can also uh, use flotation to capture it too. And then the silver uh, occurs as sulfur salts associated with lead and zinc primarily. Okay, so from my perspective and knowing what I do about, you know, other deposits in this region, I don't see anything out of the ordinary with this deposit compared to anything else. And all of the rest of the mines in, in this region have pretty good metallurgy. They make great flotation concentrates uh, and, and gravity concentrates in the case of tin. So I'll let, let Bill take it from there. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good summary. You know, I, I think the problem is that a lot of people in North America in particular are so used to just copper or just gold. And the only time they hear about a polymetallic deposit is when it has metallurgical issues. But in Bolivia, they've been mining and processing these deposits uh, very successfully for a, for a long, long time. I mean, we know that the major tin mineral is... Quentin mentioned is cassiterite, which is a real plus. Uh, the zinc is sphalerite, and the indium goes with sphalerite, and the cadmium goes with sphalerite. The silver, we know, goes with galena. So when you produce a, a lead concentrate, you'll get most of your uh, silver. Obviously, we have more work to do on the, and we, we have a, a very aggressive metallurgical program right now with uh, Blue Coast, uh, which is a top top lab out in uh, Vancouver Island. And uh, we have a consultant, uh, Mike Hollywell, who's, uh, if not the best, certainly one of the best tin metallurgists on the planet. He lives in tin country in Cornwall. So he's directing the whole program on on, on tin. So yeah, I, certainly everything I've seen thus far, yes, we have some work to do. We have to do things like optimizing grain, grain size to optimize recovery. Um, but we certainly haven't run into anything that says we can't do it. It will be a plant that will have a number of circuits. You'll have a zinc, a, a zinc flotation circuit, a lead flotation circuit. We also have to look at copper because we get copper zones up to 1% popping up. Um, gold pops up every now and then being significant. And then, of course, tin will be gravity, but there may be uh, there may be some for the some finer tin. Maybe it'll be floatable. So anyway, the metallurgists are looking at all that, and I'm certainly very confident at the end of the day we'll come out with a very good flow sheet. Now, what would a reasonable or uh, yeah reasonable uh, expected tin recovery to be in other projects or in this project? Can you put a number on that? Uh, well, I, I'd say the experience in, in in Bolivia, they typically get up to, say, 80% with a, a 50% uh, concentrate grade. That's fairly typical from, uh, I know, from what Oswaldo knows from the other mines. Okay. So, you know, and, and we, we did put a summary out for uh, silver, lead, and zinc because we did more work on that early on uh, before as as Quentin mentioned, the tin started to show up. Uh, and, and certainly um, 
Richard Gowns, chief metallurgist in uh, uh, for us in in Micon. You know, he was very confident of producing uh, a very good quality uh, lead and zinc concentrate with most of the silver going to the lead. And thus far, that's certainly what we're seeing. So it, it's still early on metallurgy. We got a lot of work to do, but, uh, you know, it, it's moving along well and we haven't seen anything that tells us we are not going to be able to uh, produce a, a, a good concentrate. Okay. Thank you for addressing those. We can move on now. Yeah, so this is just a, a section here just to give a general form of the mineralization here. It's almost like a, a shallow sheet in many cases. When you look at it, you can see the purple is greater than 110, big concentration here. We only have a, a results from a few holes to the northwest, but again, look at the scale across here, 1,200 meters. It's very, very extensive. Now this is this is one we're particularly excited about, and this will lead into what I think is is one of the big uh, defining moments uh, when we look back January 26th of last year when we put out hole 15, we discovered Santa Barbara. That was a paradigm shift for Iska Iska. What I'm showing you now, I think, is the next paradigm. Uh, shift. And this is our whole DSBU-3 that had a terrific intersection, silver, lead, and zinc, but especially very, very good grade tin over a phenomenal length, 373 meters. So this is a cross section here. Uh, whole DSBU-3 uh, here is drilled to the west at minus 50. Uh, you can see the long purple stretch there. But you can also see the other holes around. These are several other underground holes in the Santa Barbara Adit. So if, if I do this drawing thing, you can see there's one heck of a big high grade zone uh, really, really starting to, to develop there. And obviously we're, going, we're doing more drilling down here uh, to better define it. Now, if you go up about a kilometer to the south here, uh, these are pictures from the sa uh, channel sampling at the Porco at it. And that's down near the Porco drilling area that I'll show you. We sample along this at it, 103 meters, really high grade silver uh, and gold and copper showing up in phenomenal tin. And you can see beautiful, these are shots I took underground, uh, beautiful massive sulfide vein. You can see the stock work here with the uh, copper oxide as you right. So let that takes me to the next one, which shows you why we're so excited about the SBU3. Yes, fantastic intersection, great tin, but look where it is. This is our 3D inversion magnetic model. This model is working extremely well to show us where tin mineralization is. And you might ask, okay, why? Well, there's basically two magnetic minerals, magnetite and pyrotite. We certainly don't have magnetite because it's a sulfide environment, but we do have pyrotite. Every time we get deeper, we get into tin, bingo, pyrotite shows up and that's magnetic. So you can see the trace here of dsb 3 here. Remember this is drilled due west at minus 50. Uh, the model here, you're looking to the Southeast you can see the Porco radial drilling here. And you can see where the this hole hit our model. And you can see the purple area, that whole area, that's where that big, huge intersection is. So of course, when we looked at the model, we realized, wow, this looks like the tip of the iceberg here. So I'm actually drilling, I have some holes into, that are going into this uh, test, this, magnetic model. And remember, you know, this is deeper, but remember I'm sitting on a hill where there's a kilometer from the valley to the peak. So this is still very accessible from the valley. Now these holes we put in Porco, they had a f some intersections, not a lot, but the one hole that did hit something was DPC-1, which it's hard to see on this drawing, but it actually clipped the edge of the model and bingo, that's where the best numbers are. So what seems to be evolving, and I think this is another major paradigm shift for ISCA, ISCA. You know, we've been focusing on the Santa Barbara area. There's no doubt we will uh, outline 
uh, a substantial resource with silver, lead, zinc, and tin up there. But what's uh, DSBU-3 really is highlighted, and we will think will be highlighted even more as we go forward, is you can think of Santa Barbara as kind of domain one. Well, this domain two is very, very likely our tin porphyry. And we've got to confirm that, obviously. Uh, but we're certainly off to a good start with DSBU-03. So if if our thinking continues and we can confirm the validity of this model, you can see the potential is huge. So I, I envision ISCA ISCA turning into, just like uh, Quinton said, we got a lead zinc silver deposit up here with some tin, and then we've got potential for a huge tin porphyry down here. Um, yeah, no kidding. It's a massive blob down there. And it sounds like a lot of drilling still to do. Quentin, any idea on how many meters you guys need to drill just in this area to truly get a handle on this and show that it could be this big? Uh, look, uh, if you look at the volumes that Bill's showing and the depths, you know, you can see the scale there in the lower left. Uh, look, this is going to take a couple hundred thousand meters of drilling ultimately to, to fully, you know, get up to say measure and indicate it. But I think at a, a high level with, uh, you know, to get it to inferred, you could probably get away with maybe 50 or 60,000 meters in the system if it behaves, uh, you know, predictably, we'll call it, uh, is well behaved. Uh, if you poke enough holes into that red blob. So I'm not talking about what's been drilled so far. I'm just talking about the red blob you see here. I think, uh, you know, call it 50 holes, uh, ultimately on the length of a, a kilometer each, that should get you in the ballpark of a resource. But, you know, Bill can weigh in because he, he's he lives it. So, Bill, also to that point, would there be a porphyry source? Would numbers get better, closer to an area here? What What's your assessment? Well, I would sort of expect that. Um you know, where uh, if you look at, um, you know, 30, 30 kilometers to the northwest, there's a, a mine called Chiroke, which is a, a tin a tin mine. It's in what they call an intrusion breccia in Bolivia, which seems to be, it's a bit of an unusual rock type. Um, it's a breccia, but it's not an explosive breccia like we're used to. It forms fairly deep. Um, tin forms as a high temperature, very deep mineral. And uh, the academic studies actually tell you these intrusion batches um, take a while to cool. Well, I, I think that we've got the potential to drill down into something like Chiroke, but this will be potentially, I think, much, much bigger. I think with respect to high grade zones, I mean, we've already seen in the SBU-3, um, there are some spectacular samples in there where we're getting, uh, you know, one and a half meters of 4.1% tin, and the sample next to it is 3.55. So uh, there's definitely potential for high, higher grade areas in this whole system. But ultimately, uh, the target is a big bulk tonnage uh, tin deposit. Okay, guys, perfect. Let's keep moving on here because we do have a number of questions. I know we still have a few more slides, so it's quick sure, no, move I'll, through I'll, them, Bill. I'll go quickly here. Let me just skip through that one. I, I'll show you. Th th this is an interesting drawing. This is uh, from Oswaldo's book. And, and this just shows a, a conceptual model for the porphyry epithermal system, the green being the higher level epithermal and the pink being the... the um, the deeper uh, porphyritic. And, and you can see the scale on the left here, Coricola, one kilometer. Well, the Iska Iska mountain basically has this entire section here. Uh, we have the upper Huawercaza, which is obviously much smaller, but same level as San Cristobal. Santa Barbara seems to be sitting about where Cerro Rico is central. And, and of course, I would add in uh, likely add in Porco down here. So this is really remarkable uh, thing about Iska Iska. We're not looking at one level here. We're in fact exploring this entire uh, section. And this next drawing just gives you a quick cartoon. 
everything you know about Andean geology, forget it. It's all reversed in in Bolivia. Tin is early, forms really deep because the crust here is 80 kilometers thick. The second stage, and, and that formed the early stage in that volcanic complex, which formed the original caldera. And then you've had a resurgent caldera where you've got uh, these dacitic domes cut by these huge breccia pipes. And that's when your epithermal silver lead zinc came in, and it also carried some tin, uh, mainly mechanically. And then what is really um, makes this gisk a rather uh, a challenge sometimes geologically, but has really upped the grade is this major tectonic stage related to the Andes. And so you've, you've moved around the silver lead and zinc in particular, but you've also structurally upgraded. So that's part of the reason why we get areas with really spectacular grade and has also pushed it out into all the rock types. And uh, so you get end up with the present day with some uplift. So just to quickly summarize then, okay, we're moving ahead on this 43101 resource, but originally we said Q2, it's probably gonna get pushed back a little bit. Why? Because we keep finding big wide intersections that clearly we have to do more drilling. Um, you know, huge target zone, but what's really exciting is, and I think it'll be another paradigm shift in Iskiska. If we can show that there's a major tin porphyry down there, this absolutely will become a world-class discovery. Uh, so exciting times of the world. Stay tuned. Uh, you're going to see lots of good stuff coming out in the coming months. Okay. Guys, let's get into a few of these other questions. I thank you for that presentation. Uh, a couple of questions came in on the same vein. That is, since you haven't, it sounds like, found any meaningful ends to Iska Iska, what's the opportunity in terms of acquiring some of the other land around what you already hold? Is that needed? Is that on the table? I know. You want to answer that, Tom? Well, basically, um, we have signed a... Uh, a confidential agreement that's a binding agreement but i i don't want to get into the details of that right now it's to do with just with uh regional bureaucracy getting the proper paperwork but we we do have something locked up to the south and we we i mean we did pick up eight other properties with our after survey quite a while ago uh coma bowl do own property to the northwest um and to the northeast, there is uh, uh, there's two owners that have uh, another t um, uh, signature from the Aster survey, which we're talking to. But from the standpoint of what we have now and, and uh, with what we're going to see uh, south, without getting into too much detail, I would suggest we probably have more than enough, wouldn't you, Bill? Yeah, well, you can see how well, remarkably well, this property does cover the caldera, which is very, very useful. All right, guys, uh, another question, actually a few again that have come in on this vein is that uh, it sounds like there's still a lot of drilling to be done. There's still a lot of blue sky potential on this project in the longer term. What's the stage here? Are you guys drilling this out? Will it be drilled out completely and then maybe a production decision be made? Do you think you're a takeover target well before even that production decision? Or do you guys drill off a portion of this, realize that, hey, look, there's a lot still here, but you can move into production fairly easily? What is the big picture play for the company? Well, I think um, this is, you know, we're in a, a pretty interesting situation at this stage. Uh, we're not going to sell this thing off uh, at this stage or look for a, you know, a partner to come in, uh, you know, to take a, uh, you know, buy in at the asset level. No, this is, this is something that uh, we believe is turning into something world class. We're not there yet. And we are going to drill until we come up with uh, something that could, could, I, I believe really enhance our valuation, our share cap valuation. And so we're just going to stick to that knitting. I, I'm, I'm not going to say who or what or how we're going to be taken out. I mean, it's pretty obvious 
how, you know, there's different ways of how this thing could be at the end of the day absorbed by a, by a major balance, balance sheet. But our job right now is to uh, try and create as much value as possible. So, um, you know, that's what we're going to do. Okay. Now, Quentin, you're technical advisor, but you're also kind of simply an investor in this with Crestcat. So how do you view this as a more of an investor? Uh, look, you know, at Crestcat, we, we tend to invest in early stage exploration stories, but we invest in ones that are going to deliver, you know, world-class opportunity. And this, this one, hands down, is the biggest story. Uh, you know, people ask me frequently, you know, what do you think about this compared to that? And it's like, hold on. I mean, when it comes to this deposit, okay, I, I can speak a little bit more liberally. Sorry, Bill and Tom, but I'm going to plow into this one. Okay, look, uh, you made a comment earlier, I think, or somebody did about, you know, how much metal value there might be in the ground here. Yeah, it is. It's remarkable. I mean, it's, you know, tens of billions of dollars, maybe a hundred plus billion dollars. Okay. That's certainly uh, possible here, especially with the porphyry potential. Um, when you compare that to other metal deposits like gold deposits, to put that in perspective, let's just use a hundred mil- billion for round numbers. I mean, you're talking about a 50 million ounce gold equivalent. There's not too many gold deposits out there that are that size. Okay. So this, this is uh, a beast. Um, it truly is, you know, this one has maybe the same metal endowment as some of the world-class uh, porphyry copper deposits. Maybe that's a better place for people to kind of, you know, rationalize what what's here. Uh, but this is, you know, hands down, uh, you know, world-class opportunity. We're sticking with it for the long term. It's, you know, it's like having a, you know, from an investor perspective, it's like having a win- winning lottery ticket in your back pocket. You know, it, you know, it's, it's not going to lose value. Uh, in fact, it'll probably go up as as time goes on. That's the upside of uh, expiration is you can add a lot of value with a drill bit. So uh, we're we're pleased to see Bill and Oswaldo and team uh, continue to drill here. Um, my view, that it, do we need to announce a resource tomorrow? No, no. I, I think there's plenty of upside here. Look at the last couple of news releases. Holy cow, if, if we start bolting on uh, drilling down in that southern area and have results that return like what we've seen in those past two news releases, you know, stay tuned. I mean, this thing could easily get to that, say, $100 billion in situ metal value very quickly. So uh, we're, we're quite content. We're happy. I guess that very much ties into Dr. Oswaldo's comments that this is the biggest in discovery in a hundred years. He made that comment, I believe, a little bit, a little while ago. So it is turning out to be quite the discovery since so much is drilling focused. A couple of quick questions here regarding can you drill all year round and what's the general turnaround time that you're seeing at the assay labs? Well, well, year round, uh, absolutely. I mean, we we haven't stopped since we started drilling in September twenty uh, twenty. Um, you know, you have a little bit of a, a rainy season, uh, which is pretty mild to deal with when you're used to doing like me doing drill programs at forty below in Timmins. Um, so it's a great place to work. Um, you know. Lab turnaround, I'm happy to say that it was a huge headache last fall because they were getting hammered with COVID restrictions. And then we we just had, uh, you know, the uh, Delta variant uh, die down and then the Omicron sh- showed up and the Omicron really uh, screwed up staffing. But um, they're through that now. Uh, and we've been addressing it several ways. Uh, firstly, we brought in AHK, uh, that is a UK based uh, lab, very good lab. Uh, so we use both ALS and AHK. AHK put up, a, a built a prep facility um, uh, on, on our site there. And uh, uh, that certainly helped. I'm using ALS over in Galway. Ireland because they have more capacity than in Lima. And so I'm doing everything we can to improve um, turnaround. And it's definitely improving. You're seeing early on in the year, we've been putting out press releases with five and six holes, which is exactly what I like. I hate one hole press releases. Um, And I'm pretty confident going forward that 
the turnaround will be uh, much improved. But having said that, uh, you're still, you know, if you can get something within uh, six or eight weeks, you're doing pretty good. And that's not just a problem for us. It's a global issue uh, in, is. in labs. Absolutely. So yeah, it's something just, like uh, one other comment I wanted to make, too, just to follow up on, on what Tom and Quinton said. Uh, you know, I've worked in this mining business all over the world. I've done everything from grassroots to production. I used to do mine audits for resources and reserves. Uh, when I worked for Desert Sun, we took the Jacobina mine and we put it back into productions. So I've worked on pre feasibility feasibility studies. Uh, I've resuscitated old mines and whatever else. Uh, we have a terrific engineering group in uh, Lima uh, run by Graham Spears. Uh, I work with Graham in Central Sun in Nicaragua. He's got a terrific engineering team. Uh, you know, Tom and I are looking to get some Bolivian engineering talent in there. So we basically are building up the team in Bolivia to carry this project forward. This, this isn't like a, an exploration group that's going to do the resource and then not know where to go. Uh, we got lots of experience and expertise, and uh, I, I've spent a lot of time underground in open pits and and uh, as i'm doing with blue coast spending a lot of time with the metallurgists so technically uh you know we're not going to run out of steam and and we've got great advisors like quentin um we've got the the micon team with us so uh you know we're we're fully capable of continuing to move this project forward all right, Tom, quickly, one last question. In terms of financing, you guys have money in the bank, but you have a lot of work going on. So what? Uh, w w how long will the current cash last you guys with all the work that's happening? So right now we have around 9 to 10 million Canadian. Our burn rates was around a million US. It'll probably go up to about 1.2 US with the fourth drill uh, on site in, in a few days. Um, so... We did uh, submit a shelf prospectus that will allow us to raise up to $100 million, but not all at once. Obviously, we have two and a half years. We can take a portion out when we decide. And the, the advantage to that is uh, the OSC is betting it as we speak. And once that's approved, then you only have a four-day turnaround on any equity deal, bought deal. So it doesn't in, impinge on your, your news flow. So obviously we will, uh, to keep this thing going, you know, we're looking minimally ne next phase, at least 50,000 meters. So there'll be a point. We have warrants that are getting, you know, at 525, uh, stock goes over $7. There's another 18 million bucks. It, it, at $7, there's a forced conversion over, I think, 10, 15 business days when it trades over seven. So, you know, there's, there's lots of money I, I'd like to mention that Cantor Fitzgerald just came out with an inaugural uh, research report. It came out two days ago. Uh, so, you know, the, the market, the, the investor base, the brokers, they're starting to take notice, um, you know, of, of, of the true, uh, just the true progress that our technical team, uh, Bill and Oswaldo, what they've accomplished. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, they really have. It's been a, well, big winner for a lot of people in the sector. It's nice to see, and it's been fun to follow along with you guys. We're going to wrap it up here. We are just over that hour limit that we post on these webinars. A recording will be available to everybody. And if we didn't get to your question, or if you come up with more questions after watching the replay, again, please email me, fleck at kereport.com, and I will be having Tom, Bill, and Quentin back on my show. So, Tom, Bill, Quentin, again, thank you very much for your time. Everybody, thank you for tuning in. We hope that you garnered a lot from this webinar. We'll, we will be doing more of them as this story continues to progress. But in the meantime, that wraps us up here. So thank you again, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks, Corey. Thanks a lot, Corey.